to Dana, Claudia, and Dan for inviting me. This is the first time I join, uh, and I would prefer to be to be there with you, Dana. But it's also a nice way of meeting anyhow. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to present to you some research I've done and I'm still doing on, on early modern thought experiments. And before introducing my research, I want to introduce the topic more broadly because thought experiments um, have received much scholarly attention, especially in the last 30 years. There has been a proliferation of studies. Uh, two years ago, uh, Routledge Companion to Thought Experiments was published in a very thick book which I, uh, of which I wrote a review. And while reviewing the book, I was struck by the fact that there is such an amazing lack of consensus uh, about a number of fundamental questions. Uh, the first and more obvious question is, what is a thought experiment and how does it differ from other forms of reasoning or mental activities involving the use of imagination? And what is interesting to see is that in um, the editors of the book in the introduction proposed to extend um, the notion of the thought experiment to include humanistic, scientific, and artistic pursuits. They propose to regard also uh, works of art and novels as thought experiments, where some of the contributors to the volume disagree with this and also provide arguments um, for which we should not consider, for example, a novel as a thought experiment. One of the arguments being that thought experiments are in fact um, uh, fictions, but fictions that help us make us claim about the world. And besides the thought experiments must be decidable. They provide an answer to a theoretical question. They do not simply serve as illustration of a problem. They really are supposed to yield an answer to the question. Um, another question which is discussed in this volume is, uh, when were thought experiments born? Because the notion of thought experiment is a re relatively uh, um, recent one. Uh, the term was used for the first time by the uh, Danish physicist Hans Christian Ørsted in uh, 1811 and made popular by Ernest Mach more than half a century later. So this is a, a label which we project onto the past. And some of the contributors to this volume address the question whether this is something we could do, we should do. And there is an agreement that it makes sense to do this. But another question is, when were thought experiments born? And some authors simply claim that we can speak of ancient thought experiments and medieval thought experiments, um, and that ancient and medieval philosophers did attribute an important function to thought experiments, even if they lacked our modern notion. But there is, for example, James uh, McAllister, who claims that thought experiments are an early modern invention. invention. They're a product of the scientific revolution. So these questions, uh, on the ontological question, what is a thought experiment, and the historical question, um, when were thought experiments, uh, when were they born, uh, are linked to the epistemological question, namely, can thought experiments produce new knowledge? And if yes, how can they do so? And this question, which has dominated the literature on thought experiments for 30 years, is also referred to as Kuhn's paradox, because Thomas Kuhn formulated the question in a paradoxical way in an article first published in 1964 and then uh, inserted in the Essential Tension in 77. The article was called The Function for Thought Experiments, and uh, Kuhn asked how it was possible then that relying exclusively upon familiar data, a thought experiment can lead to new knowledge or to new understanding of nature. And Kuhn's answer was that in fact, uh, thought experiments cannot really produce new knowledge, but they can help us reconceptualize the world. And for this reason, thought experiments were regarded by Kuhn as one of the essential analytic tools which are developed during crisis and which then help to promote basic conceptual reform. So thought experiments as essential tools during scientific revolutions. As said, this question, can thought experiments, so can an experiment which is only performed in the laboratory of the mind really produce new knowledge? This question was also at the center of a debate between James Brown and John Norton. And James Brown famously argued that thought experiments are platonic tools 
which enable us to go beyond the old data, beyond empirical data, and acquire a priori knowledge of nature. John Norton uh, uh, objected to this view, and in his view, the thought experiments can never transcend empiricism. So according to Norton, thought experiments are nothing else than arguments in disguise. All thought experiments can be simply reformulated. We can forget about all the picturesque element, elements, and they can simply be reformulated as logical arguments. And they do not, they are not a kind of mysterious new window onto the physical world, which is obviously an answer to Brown. And then there are also some positions in between. Uh, Nancy Nersessian, for example, who claims, yes, that thought experiments can be reformulated as arguments, but they do not work as arguments because they are they involve mental modeling. So by contemplating a mental model, we can jump to conclusions without having uh, to take all the necessary steps and intermediate steps in a logical argument. Um, now, Brown, Norton, Kuhn uh, were, are philosophers of science uh, who are mainly concerned with uh, thought experiments from the history of physics. Uh, but of course, we know that, uh, especially in recent uh, years, thought experiments are also very prominent in philosophy, especially in analytic philosophy. There are some scholars who even claim that thought experiments are the occupational vice of armchair philosophers. So um, there are studies who address the question of the relation between philosophical and scientific thought experiments. And there is a somewhat shared idea, shared view that philosophical thought experiments tend to be more tricky and less successful than their scientific counterpart. And this is, for example, an idea which was expressed by Nicholas Rescher in his book, What If? Thought Experiment, uh, Experimentation in Philosophy. It's an ontology of thought experiments with an introduction in which Rescher suggests that there is an essential difference between philosophical and scientific thought experiments. Uh, Rescher claims that philosophical thought experiments are generally concerned with concepts and ideas, with modes of thinking and talking, whereas what scientific thought experiments do is try to second guess uh, something which real experiments can assert, and namely what happens in nature. So according to Rescher, philosophical thought experiments are concerned with concept and ideas, whereas real experiment and, and scientific thought experiments address nature, which is somewhat naive view, as if science physics was able to provide us direct access to nature and whether, uh, as if this access was not mediated by concepts. Uh, and as a consequence of this, Rescher concludes that philosophical thought experiments tend to be less successful than their scientific counterpart. Uh, Roy Sorensen, in an influential book published in 1993 on thought experiments, uh, had a somewhat more subtle um, approach to this question. But here what we see, he explicitly claimed that scientific thought experiments were his main um, object of interest. So scientific thought experiments, especially those in physics, are the clear cases. So my primary goal is to establish true and interesting generalizations about them. Success here will radiate to my secondary goal of understanding philosophical thought experiments. Philosophy differs from science in degree, not in kind. So contrary to um, Rescher, Sorensen suggests that there is a difference of degree, not in kind. There is also a passage in which we say we can establish analogies between philosophical and scientific thought experiments. And yet he suggests also that philosophical thought experiments are more controversial than their scientific counterparts. And that this analogy with science is especially striking in the subfield of ethics and aesthetics, for evaluative thought experiments appear hopelessly marooned by the fact value gap. And here maybe it could be interesting and important to um, say that one way of classifying thought experiments is by introducing a distinction between three categories of thought experiments, factual thought experiments, which uh, uh, seek a, an answer to the question, what would happen in such a situation? So you describe a scenario and you ask what would happen here. Uh, conceptual thought experiments, which are often used in philosophy, in which the question is, how should we understand or describe the situation? 
and then evaluative thought experiments, which are used in the field of ethics, in which the question is, what are political philosophy? What should one do? What would be right to do in this situation? Now, of course, like all classifications, this is a problematic classification, but this is something which is often used to distinguish among thought experiments. So the idea is that factual thought experiments are less problematic than conceptual and even, and even more so evaluative thought experiments. And here, this is a philosopher, Kathleen Wilkes, who also in the 90s published the book, Real People, Personal Identity uh, Without Thought Experiments, in which she objected against this habit of re uh, resorting to thought experiments in philosophical debate, notably in the debate on personal identity. And Wilkes, again, um, reflected on the difference between uh, physical thought experiments and philosophical thought experiments. He wrote that there is a striking difference between thought experiments in science and those in the philosophy of minds or ethics, so conceptual and evaluative thought experiments. In physical thought experiment, the background is generally adequately described, whereas in philosophical thought experiment, the possible world is often inadequately described. She provides examples. She says, you know, if Stavin uh, uses, uh, formulates his famous thought experiment, he clearly says, for example, that the chain rolling on inclined plane, that there is no friction. So he gives us all in relevant information. Philosophers, when they describe uh, imagined scenarios, they provide us not enough information. And she refers, if I'm not wrong, to Plato's ring of jigs. And he, he says, for example, Plato does not tell us whether the ring makes us only, would make people only invisible or also intangible. So we do not, we are not given enough information to decide. And here, and this is more or less what Fresher also claims, scientific thought experiments deal with natural kinds, whereas philosophical thought experiments uh, deal with notions, for example, the notion of personal identity, which are often indeterminate. So it's difficult to decide about them by using thought. So this brings us to the last question, which was debated in the literature, and then I will introduce my own research. And this question, which is often addressed, is when is a thought experiment successful and when does it fail? Here I've got a plural instead of a singular. Uh, so Catherine Wilkes uh, explains in her book that she thinks that philosophical thought experiments always fail. Why? Because while so the thought experiments in the field of physics employ impossible assumptions which are irrelevant to the conclusion. So for example, if Einstein supposes that a human observer travels at the speed of light, the fact that this is not possible does not affect the result of a thought experiment. Whereas philosophical thought experiments often uh, tend to draw conclusions from impossible premises. Uh, and especially in the field of personal ident identity, she says, we see philosophers using scenarios like two persons swapping bodies, half brain, brain transplantations, brains who sp which split like amoebas. And these scenarios are incompatible with our experience of the world. They're incompatible with what we know, for example, about the brain. So when scenarios are so far fetched, we enter a situation which all bets are off. We cannot trust our intuition. And this is a point Thresher also makes. So if the scenarios are so far-fetched and so um, remote from our experience, there is no intuition we can trust, and hence our answers to thought experiments become unreliable. Uh, finally, I want to mention an article by Pinenburg and Atkinson published in 2003, which explicitly addresses the question, this is the title, when are thought experiments who wants? And Feinberg and Atkinson start by telling us when thought experiments are successful. And in their view, a thought experiment is successful if, if it produces consensus. So we are presented with a scenario and the answer we give, um, there is a consensus about what uh, would happen in this scenario or how we, one should describe the scenario. So uh, they are successful if they induce the same belief in the majority of people that are exposed to them. So when this doesn't happen, where there is no consensus, a thought experiment is a poor one. So what are the reasons of failure or the grounds of failure? 
And then, so they say, so thought experiments fail if different people give different answers to the thought experiment. So if the conclusions contradict one another, or they are unsuccessful, they're poor ones, if the conclusions beg the question. So for example, if a thought experiment is built on a premise which is at stake, okay? So if a thought experiment is built on a premise which is what uh, the thought experiment is meant to prove, if there is a circularity in the argument. Um, so as, as an example of failure of the first kind, they quote the famous thought experiment of Mary, the color scientist. Mary is a scientist who knows everything about the perception of colors, the neurophysiology of perception, but she has grown up in a black and white room. One day, Mary can go into the real world. If she uh, exit the room and she sees colors for the first time. And the question is, uh, does Mary learn something new? And here uh, they claim, you know, Jackson, who has proposed the thought experience, says, of course, she does. And Churchland answers, uh, no, she does not. So this is a thought experiment which does not um, yield consensus, hence it is a poor one. A uh, thought experiment which begs the question in their view would be, uh, for example, an example would be uh, Chalmers thought experiments with zombies. They say uh, Chalmers uh, formulated thought experiments in which there are zombies without consciousness, but the very question whether there can be um, zombie without consciousness is what is at stake. So the thought experiment is built on a premise which is what must be proven by a thought experiment. So there is here an obvious case of circularity. And Pannerberg and Atkinson say, look, also in the field of physics, there are poor thought experiments, but they are less common. And the failure is less uh, problematic because usually scientists, physicists, can resort to real experiments to solve the issue, whereas philosophers can only use of thought experiments. So poor thought experiments in the field of philosophy produce more damage than poor thought experiments in the field of physics. Uh, why am I telling you all of this? Because uh, I deal with thought experiments in the early modern period. And the first uh, point I want to make is that, as we all know, in the early modern period, there was no clear cut distinction between science and philosophy. Not only is what we nowadays call physics was still called natural philosophy and was an integral part of philosophy, but some of the heroes of the scientific revolutions, of course, were at the same time um, philosophers. So you have got figures like uh, Leibniz, Locke, Descartes, using thought experiments, which we, some thought experiments with which we would nowadays label as philosophical thought experiments and thought experiments which uh, we would uh, label as physical thought experiments. Uh, so the division was not real. But I think as a second point I try to make in my research, and this is more important to me, is the fact that I think that philosophers of science uh, tend to overemphasize the heuristic and demonstrative power on, of thought experiments. And they neglect the fact that thought experiments are very often used as, the, as uh, polemical tools, as rhetorical tools, and also as, as pedagogical tools. So thought experiments, the function of thought experiments is to provoke discussion, sometimes to generate lack of consensus in order to emphasize, to shed light on the incompatibility between different theories and theoretical frameworks. So what I want to do now is to try and provide some examples, discuss some examples from thought experiments from the early modern period and show to you that also poor thought experiments can in fact be very productive. The first example I'm going to provide um, uh, is derived from Galileo's Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, published in 1632, the work for which Galileo not, was notoriously condemned in 1633. Now, Galileo is an author who, who plays an important role in many studies of on thought experiments because he's the author of what, what is considered one of the most successful thought experiments in the history of science namely a thought experiment with which he proved that in a void space, bodies would fall, all bodies would fall at the same rate, independent of their size or material. 
So this is an example of a thought experiment which produces new knowledge. So it's often discussed as an example of a successful thought experiment. In Galileo's works, we find, however, many more thought experiments which have not received attention in the literature, probably because they do not really produce new knowledge. And I've tried to map these thought experiments. I've published an article on this in the philosophy of science two years ago. And um, I tried to, to discuss thought experiments, which by the standards I um, presented to you would be poor thought experiments. And my claim is this, that these thought experiments um, are useful uh, because they enable us also to understand the reason Galileo had to resort to thought experiments. So by analyzing these thought experiments, Experiments, we can also try and understand uh, what kind of function Galileo attributed to thought experiments, why Galileo thought that it could be useful to discuss imaginary scenarios. Um, so I have collected many examples and now I've selected one for you today. Uh, in the dialogue, we find it's a dialogue among three characters, Simplicio, who's the Aristotelian, Salviati, who represents Galileo's own views, and Sagredo, who's the wise man, who's the arbiter and um, who mediates sometimes in these discussions. Uh, so in the dialogue, the three characters discuss a number of imaginary scenarios. There are a few cases in which they agree about what would happen in imaginary situations. So there is a consensus. They intuitively give the same answer to the question, what would happen here? And then an interesting discussion usually follows in which the interlocutors try to understand how their imagined solution to the thought experiment relates to their theoretical background. And usually Simplicio has to understand, is led to, to uh, realize that his solution contradicts the theoretical background. Okay, so there are a few cases in which they agree. The answer is intuitive and then they reflect on their answer. In most cases, they disagree about what would happen. So a bad thought experiment, according to Pineberg and Atkinson, because there is no consensus. Um, and I will discuss one of these examples. So uh, in the first day of the dialogue, the uh, characters, the three characters discuss the Aristotelian worldview. Uh, and one of the things they discuss is the Aristotelian view of gravity. According to Aristotle, have bodies fall downwards because they tend towards the center of the universe, which only accidentally coincides with the center of the Earth. Okay, so they do not tend towards the center of the Earth, but towards the center of the universe. And in De Cello, Aristotle provides, discusses an imaginary scenario, and he wonders what would happen if the Earth were removed to the place where the moon is. He says, if the Earth Earth were removed where the moon now is, heavy bodies, stone, would continue to fall towards the center of the universe because this is their natural place. Okay, so separate parts of it, of the earth, would not move towards the hole, so towards the whole earth, which is now where the moon is, but towards the place where the hole is now, so towards the center of the universe. Now, in the first day of the dialogue, we find a kind of variation on this theme. So what Simplicio, the Aristotelian character, so this is Drake's translation, uh, says that if the Earth was removed from the center of the universe, according to Simplicio, the Earth would immediately return to its place, because this is the place where it belongs. The Earth, if it were removed, would go back towards the center of the universe. Why does Simplicio draw this conclusion? Because he says, just as parts of the Earth removed from the whole return to their place naturally and spontaneously in a straight motion, so they fall down, so it may be inferred, granted that the same is the ratio of the uh, whole and the parts, that if the terrestrial globe were forcibly removed from the place assigned to it by nature, it would return by a straight line. So, of course, Salviati, who represents Galileo's view cannot agree with the solution. Salviati does not think that if the Earth were removed, to begin with, he does not believe, of course, that the Earth, that, uh, the earth occupies the center of the universe, and hence he disagrees on with Simplicio's solution. Uh, to begin with, Salviati 
Gabby says that this thought experiment begs the question. So neither Aristotle nor you can ever prove that the Earth is de facto the center of the universe. So Salviati says to Simplicio, you're assuming what is in question, you're begging the question. You cannot use this thought experiment to prove that the Earth is at the center of the universe uh, because your thought experiment is built on the very assumption you want to prove. Salviati has a different view about what gravity is. Salviati endorses, of course, Galileo's view, which is also Copernicus' view, according to which gravity is nothing else than the tendency of bodies to return to their cause. And by the way, I want to say that this view was not only um, Copernicus' view, it was also the view of Plutarch. And this month, an article is going to appear in ISIS, which I've published together with a colleague, Frederick Bakker, which deals with the influence of Plutarch's theory of gravity on uh, Galileo. So it's in the June uh, issue of ISIS. Um, so Salviati endorses this view according to which gravity is the body's tendency to reunite to the whole. <clears throat> and according to Salviati, and it's also a view which was already defended by Plutarchus, this tendency is not only found in the Earth, but is found in all bodies with a spherical shape. So also in the Sun, in the Moon, all celestial bodies have their own center of gravity. So what Galileo says, Salviati says, just as all the parts of the Earth mutually cooperate to form a whole, why may we not believe that the Sun, Moon, and other world bodies are also round in shape merely by concordant instinct and natural tendencies of all their component parts. If at any time one of these parts were forcibly separated from the whole, is it not reasonable to believe that it would return spontaneously and by natural tendency? So if one could detach a part from the moon, this part would fall back to the moon in a straight line like stones do with the earth. In this case, it is Simplicio who rejects the Aristotelian, uh, Salviati's thought experiment. And he says to Salviati, it is vain to inquire, as you do, what a part of the globe of the sun or moon would do if separated from its whole, because what you inquire into would be the consequences of an impossibility. For as Aristotle also demonstrates, celestial bodies are invariant, impenetrable, and unbreakable. Hence, such a case could never arise. So Simplicio says, you're building your, your thought experiment on an impossible premise. According to Aristotle, of course, celestial bodies are immutable. So one cannot modify them. So it would be impossible to detach a part from a celestial body. So again, from the standard of Feinberg and Atkinson, this is a, a bad thought experiment, a poor thought experiment, because it is built on a premise which, according to Simplicio, is impossible and which Simplicio does not share. To which Salviati replies, I'm surprised that you should need to have Aristotle's fallacy revealed, it being so obvious that, he's a, that he assumes what is in question. So again, Salviati says, you are begging the question. Now, here we see a case in which Simplicio refuses to, to discuss a thought experiment by Salviati, because this thought experiment is based on a premise he cannot share. There is another example in the second day of the dialogue in which the opposite happens. It is Salviati who refuses to make the prediction on a thought experiment presented by Simplicio. So we are here in the second day of the work. The topic of the second day is the daily motion of the Earth. And Simplicio reads, uh, allowed passages from the Disquisitiones Mathematice by the German Jesuit Locher, uh, the work published in 1614. Locher objects against the motion of the Earth, saying that it seems impossible that if the Earth rotated, that objects as different as birds and um, heavy bodies and rain and clouds could participate and, and fire could participate in the rotation of the Earth. Uh, and then at a certain point he, uh, and this is Simplicio who reads aloud, who quotes Locher, and then Locher says, is in the opinion of such men, the Copernicans, if the whole earth together with the water were reduced to nothing, 
no hail or rain would fall from the clouds because it, if gravity is the tendency to go towards the hole, if the hole were removed, um, it could not rain. The rain could not fall from the clouds, but would only be carried naturally around, nor would any fire or flaming thing ascend, which, however, experience and reason refute. So according to Locher, he says, according to the Copernican, it could not rain if the earth were destroyed, but experience and reason refute this conclusion. And Salviati is surprised about this, that Locher thinks to know what would happen if the earth were destroyed. The providence of this philosopher is admirable and worthy of great praise, says Salviati with his usual irony. He not contending himself with thinking of things that might happen in the course of nature, but trying to provide himself against occasions on which things happened, which are absolutely known never to happen. Okay, so he says, you know, we can make guesses about things which would happen hypothetically in an imaginary scenario in uh, the course of nature, but we cannot know what would happen if the laws of nature were abrogated. And then he continues, I should gladly pay to have a chat with this fellow in order to ask him whether when this globe vanished, it took away also the common center of gravity. And then he goes on asking questions. So here it is also interesting to see that Salviati, like Wilkes and Rescher, thinks that some thought experiments are too poorly described. So he says, if you want me to, to begin with, he thinks, you know, this is not a thought experiment on which we should reason. But if you want me to provide an answer, at least do provide some more information. So he says it is not well adequately described, this scenario. And then he says, and finally, to give this philosopher a less indefinite reply, I say to him that I know just as much about what would happen after the earth was annihilated as you would have known about what was going to take place on it and around it before it was created. So again, what Salviati is telling us here, that he thinks that the only way in which we can provide answers to thought experiments is by relying on our intuition, intuition which is based on our experience of the world. So we cannot, our intuition cannot help us decide about situations in which the laws of nature are put on hold um, because we cannot trust our intuition. And here, to paraphrase Rescher and Wilkes, we find ourselves in a situation in which all bets are off. Uh, so by looking at the dialogues between the interlocutors, we can see that Galileo had fairly um, sophisticated views concerning the limits and the power of thought experiments. And by having his interlocutors disagree about these imaginary scenarios, what Galileo wants to suggest, I think, is that the contemplation of imaginary scenarios is theory laden. So the solutions we give to thought experiments is determined by our theoretical background. So it is absolutely no surprise that uh, Simplicio, who thinks, of course, that who adheres to the geocentrical theory, uh, gives different solutions to a thought experiment than Salviati, who is a partisan of Copernicus theory. So again, the contemplation of thought experiments is theory laden. The answers we give is, in some cases, determined by our theoretical assumptions. So this means also that thought experiments become play an important role um, in, in as much as they become magnifying glasses, which enable Galileo to shed light on the incompatibility between Simplicio's framework and Salviati's framework. So they show how incommensurable the geocentric and the heliocentric worldview are. So we could claim again that Galileo ex, ex, uh, uh, devises on purpose poor thought experiments in order to help the reader to understand the incompatibility between the theoretical frameworks of his uh, interlocutors of his dialogue. And now I want to move to the second uh, case. Um, which is Locke's thought experiment of Castor and Pollux, which is found in the second book of an essay concerning human understanding. And here I have to give credit to a former student of mine, Ross Storyanov, who wrote uh, under my supervision a research master thesis on these topics uh, years ago. 
Uh, now, uh, Souls and Bradfield I mean, published years ago an interesting article on the thought experiments in Locke's essay concerning human understanding, showing that most of Locke's thought experiments have an anti-Cartesian function. So they have, so again, they are polemical instruments like Galileo's thought experiments, and the polemical target is very often Descartes. And the same holds true for the thought experiment which I'm going to present to you, that of Castro and Pollux. And before presenting this thought experiment, one has to understand hence the theory, which is the target of Locke's criticism. Descartes famously claims that the soul always thinks. And this is a point on which Locke disagrees with Descartes. According to Descartes, the soul cannot exist without thinking. In the second meditation, Descartes famously claims, I am, I exist, this is certain, but for how long? For as long as I'm thinking. For if I were to cease all thinking, I would also cease to exist. Another uh, claim, uh, assumption of Descartes, is that thought is always conscious thought. Uh, and this is something on which Locke agrees. So Locke denies that the soul always thinks, but he th thinks that if the soul thinks, then the soul is conscious of its own thoughts. And this is what Descartes claims in the appendix to the answer to the second sets of replies, uh, the, 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 the replies to the second sets of objections against the meditation. He says, thought, I use this term to include everything that is within us in such a way that we are immediately aware of it. And then the third claim is that Descartes, and this is the discourse of method, that personal identity is in fact coincides with the identity of the soul. So the identity of the soul is what constitutes personal identity. The soul would not fail to be whatever it is, even if the body did not exist. So what constitutes our identity is the identity of our soul, but what Descartes is also claiming here is of course that the soul can exist without the body and of course he also thought that the body could exist without the soul. As it but why should it not always think, since it is a thinking substance? So long as the mind is joined to the body, then in order for it to remember thoughts which it had in the past, it is necessary for some traces of them to be imprinted on the brain. It is by turning to these that the mind remembers. So is it really surprising if the brain of a man in deep sleep is unsuited to receive these traces. So what um, Descartes is telling us is that the soul always thinks during sleep too, that during sleep the soul is conscious of its own thoughts. The problem is that during sleep the, the link between body and soul becomes more loose. So what happens is that the, the thinking of the soul does not leave traces on the brain, traces which we can use to remember then what the soul was thinking. So the fact that we forget what we uh, think during sleep does not mean that there is no thought during sleep. Okay, so there is thought, there is consciousness, but then there is no memory. Okay, so here we see Locke who imagined this thought experiment and what he does is to very consciously build his thought experiments on premises of which he's sure that his adversaries, hence the Cartesians, would accept them. And he says, the soul during sound sleep thinks, say this man, the Cartesian. And it must necessarily be conscious of its own perceptions. But it has all this apart. The sleeping man, it is plain, is conscious of nothing of all this. Let us suppose then that the soul of Castor, so Castor and Pollux are the mythological twins, while he's sleeping, retires from his body, which is no impossible supposition for the men I've here to do with, who so liberally allow life without a thinking soul to all other animals. Okay, so he says, let us assume that there is Castor, and that while Castor is sleeping, the soul can exit his body. And he says, this is no impossible assumption for the Cartesians. This man can then not judge it impossible or a contradiction that the body should live without the soul, nor that the soul should subsist and think or have perception, even perception of happiness or misery without the body. Now, so the soul of Castor leaves the body of Castor, and what does it do? It enters the body of Pollux. So Castor and Pollux are awake and sleeping by turns, 
and there is one soul they share which inhabits the body. So while uh, Castor is sleeping, the soul moves to Pollux's body, and when Pollux is sleeping, the soul moves to Castor's uh, body. Let us then say, I suppose, the soul of Castor separated during his sleep from his body to think apart. Let us suppose too that it chooses for its scene of thinking the body of another man, Pollux, who is sleeping without a soul. For if Castor's soul can think, while Castor is asleep, what Castor is never conscious of, it is no matter what place it chooses to think in. We have here then the bodies of two men with only one soul between them, which we are supposed to sleep and wake by turns. And the soul still thinking in the waking man, or of the sleeping man, is never conscious, has never the least perception. I ask them what in Castor and Pollux does with only one soul between them, which thinks and perceives in one what the other is never conscious of, nor is concerned for, are not two as distinct persons as Castor and Hercules or as Socrates and Plato were. So this is a rhetorical question, and Locke is convinced that the reader instinctively will say, of course, we can say that Castor and Pollux are two different persons, because Castor does not know what happens in the, to Pollux and the other way around. So the soul, well, the soul is in Castor's body. The soul has no memory of what has happened in Pollux's body. And when the soul is in Pollux's body, it has no memory of what has happened in Castor's body. Hence, Locke concludes, we should conclude that these are two different persons. But according to Descartes, we should say that they are the same person because they share the same soul. So of course, you know, according to Locke, we know personal ident identity is a matter of psychological continuity, and there is here no psychological continuity. Um, so what this uh, student of mine had you know, doing, what he did, he was to look at Leibniz, what Leibniz did with his thought experiment in his new essays concerning human understanding. So Leibniz wrote these new essays as an answer to, um, to Locke's essay, and he constructed the, um, his work as a dialogue uh, between Philalethes and Theophilus. Philalethes represents Locke's position, so he summarizes Locke's view, and then Theophilus represents Leibniz. So Philalethes summarizes the argument and says, if you had accepted the Cartesian view, I would have drawn the following conclusion from the thought experiment. Since the bodies of Castor and Pollux can stay alive, while sometimes having a soul and sometimes not, and then he continues. So, he summarizes the thought experiment. And he says, if you had accepted the Cartesian view. And now Theophilus says that he doesn't want to make a prediction about this thought experiment because the thought experiment is built on a premise which he cannot accept. As for the fiction about a soul which animates different bodies, that is one of those fictions which go against the nature of things, like space without body and body without motion which arise from the incomplete notions of the philosophers and which were banished when one goes a little deeper. Within each substance, there is a perfect bond between the future and the past, which is what creates the identity of the individual. So the, um, Leibniz rejects the, the possibility that the soul could exit the body. And hence, for him, the thought experiment does not make sense. It doesn't, it's not even worth trying to analyze this scenario. Um, what I've said is that in the case of Galileo, I said that I've had the impression that thought experiments become magnifying glasses, which enable us to shed light, to emphasize the difference, the incompatibility uh, between different assumptions and theoretical frameworks. I have the impression that the same thing happens here. Uh, the thought experiment helps us dissect the assumptions which are at stake. I started by saying that Descartes thinks that the soul always thinks, that thought is always conscious, and that the soul can be separated from the body. Locke disagrees with Descartes he, uh, about the fact that the soul always thinks. He denies this. Leibniz, if one looks at, I cannot now quote the whole thing, he agrees. I have got the quotes, I can present them later if you want. Leibniz agrees with Descartes that the soul always thinks. But Descartes always, all, even also thinks that the thought is always conscious. And this is something on which Locke agrees with Descartes 
Uh, but Leibniz disagrees. According to Leibniz, the soul always thinks, but as we know, there are also unconscious thoughts. There is a gradation, gradation notoriously of perception and apperception. Um, and then what about the fact that the soul can be separated from the body? Locke builds his thought experiment on this assumption. He says, you know, he grants it to his adversary. So he builds the thought experiment on this assumption, not because he believes in it, but he says, you know, this is what you Cartesians think. And so I, I, I grant this, uh, this premise to you. And Leibniz says, given that I disagree on this, it's not even worth considering this thought experiment. So to Leibniz, this is not, it's a poor thought experiment. To Locke, it is a good one because it, ena it enables him to challenge the Cartesian view of personal identity. Um, and as said, these are all the quotes which are related to the discussion of the thought experiment, which enables us to spell out the disagreement between Locke and uh, Descartes. So this is a passage in which Locke denies that the soul always thinks. He says, this is not necessary. Just as for a body, it's not necessary always to move. Bodies can be at rest. So the souls can also be at rest and be without thoughts. But then he agrees, to, he grants to Descartes that if the soul is thinking, one cannot think without being sensible of it, without being conscious of it. And here, this is Leibniz granting, agreeing with Descartes that the soul always thinks. And he also says that it is not true that bodies can be without motions. There are, there's also motions within bodies and there's always thought in the soul. But thought, as said, is not always conscious. And so just as there are imperceptible bodies and invisible movements, in the same way, there are countless inconspicuous perceptions. And then, Leibniz explicitly says, although I share the Cartesian's view that the soul always thinks, I part company with them on the other two points. I believe that beasts have imperishable, imperishable souls and that no soul, human or otherwise, is ever without some body. So again, by looking at this thought experiment, which would be a, um, a bad thought experiment from our uh, from the point of view of Feinberg and Atkinson, we are able to shed light on the uh, agreement, points of agreement and disagreement uh, among these three authors. So if we go back uh, to what I said at the beginning of this lecture, what are the reasons of failure according to Feinberg and Atkinson, but also explicitly construct thought experiment disagree. Carla Rita, I think we've missed a few lines. Can you hear? We might have, I think we have might. Uh, we, we lost her entirely, I think. Lost her entirely, yeah. Well, let's, let's wait for a moment for her to, uh, um, to come back. Such are the miracles of technology. Yeah. She's coming back, okay. Yes. So here I am again, I'm sorry. This was Zoom reminding me that I had to wrap up. This was the end, the end of my, can you, can you all hear me? Yes, we can, yes. Shall I again share the screen? Yes, I was really, I'd reached my conclusion. Um, so the reasons of failures, according to Feinberg and Atkinson, they are when different conclusions are drawn from the same thought experiment and when conclusions beg the question. 
And I've provided you with some examples in which, in fact, this is exactly what happens. But what I claimed is that uh, Galileo, Locke, and Leibniz are very much aware of this, which shows, in fact, that if we look at thought experiments not from a uh, from a historical point of view with different with uh, uh, different approach, we understand that poor thought experiments can in fact be good ones because as said, they can help us shed light on um, important philosophical debates and scientific debates and they become a very useful polemical instrument. And this was my conclusion. Thank you for your attention. Very good. Thank you very, very much, Carla Rita. Um, if you have questions, please put them up on the, um, or please indicate them on the uh, chat and uh, we will um, uh, call on you. Are there any questions? Um, yeah. Okay, first of all, um, uh, Hopping Lu Adder. I see quite a few questions. Shall I read them or shall I simply open the chat? Well, I, I, I was going to ask uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, to turn on a uh, microphone. Okay, sorry. Uh, th thanks. Um, Sorry, I didn't expect uh, that I would uh, be called on to, to, to explain my question. So I was raising a question in the chat uh, about the relationship between the difference or between uh, thought experiment and the hypothesis. So re the reason I'm asking is that um, I would think that the Galileo example you gave um, is a kind of an example um, of hypothesis. Uh, if that were the case, typically I would think like hypothesis would have the in addition to the criteria you mentioned, um, a hypothesis would also have, uh, a good hypothesis would also have to meet the additional criteria, uh, criteria of being um, verifiable and falsifiable. Um, I wonder what, um, what do you think? Yeah, so I think the first thing is that of course, thought experiments are hypothetical scenarios. So there is an hypothetical element. But not all hypotheses, of course, can count as thought experiments. So Sophie Roux, for example, in, in an article she wrote together with Goffrey uh, about thought experiments, what she claims is that thought experiments have got three um, uh, elements. Uh, they must be counterfactual, but they must involve a concrete scenario. So otherwise, we could call all geometric mathematical demonstration, whenever you say, let's consider you know, a line, a point, this would also come forward experience. So what we lack in mathematics is this concrete element of visualization in which there is a concrete scenario. Um, so of course, you know, this um, in the case of uh, Galileo, there is an hypothesis, uh, which, and then the question we, sh we should ask is, is this scenario meant to uh, test the hypothesis or to illustrate the hypothesis? And I think you're right if you say it's not a real illustrate uh, testing of the hypothesis. So what Galileo is saying, look, you are trying to use this imaginary scenario, this thought experiment to prove that gravity is the body's tendency to uh, go towards the center of the universe. But what if I told you that gravity is something else, that gravity is the body's tendency to reunite to the whole? Now, then I present you with another, with another uh, scenario. And if we start from my assumption, then one should conclude that, that one could detach a part from the moon and then this part will go back. So one could claim, in fact, that this is not that when, when Salviati discusses his thought experiment, he's aware of the fact that he cannot convince Simplicio of the truth of his argument. But what he's saying, he's using this scenario to say, you know, if you, if you reason from my point of view, I present you with an alternative scenario and why couldn't we reach this conclusion? So we see that the earth is as a spherical shape, just like the, the moon. And the spherical shape is an indication, according to Salviati, that the parts tend to cohere, that there is a cohesion, which is gravity. Hence, all spherical bodies have their own center of gravity. Hence, why not to think that a part of the moon would behave like a part of the Earth? 
and this is another important thing, is that many thought experiments involve the use of analogy. So how do you know what would happen to a part of the moon if it were detached? Salviati claims that he can infer the behavior of part of the moon from the behavior of part of the Earth. And for him, it is very important that he has proven in the very safe first day that the moon and the Earth look very much like one another. Okay, so in the, in the discourses concerning natural religion, Hume refers to Galileo's analogy between the Earth and the Moon as one example of a good analogy uh, in opposition to the bad analogy between the world and the clock. So many thought experiments involve the use of analogy. So Galileo reasons on the basis of an analogy, but he knows, of course, that he will not convince Simplicio, who denies that the Earth and the Moon are alike, and who denies, of course, that gravity is the technical I don't know whether this was an answer. Okay, the next time, uh, I'm sorry, are you finished? Okay, yeah. the, uh, the next person on our list is N.K. Shenad. Hi, um, uh, am I audible? Yes, very good. Okay, um, uh, thank you so much. Um, you are, uh, conclusion seems very, persuasive, um, but uh, at least in the case of physics, consider... Um, in the case of? Physics. Yeah. Uh, consider uh, the EPR dot experiment and uh, uh, Maxwell's Beeman. Uh, both these generators uh, considerable diverse opinions and uh, the debate continues. Uh, that seems to be the positive aspect of uh, these two thought experiments. That's why they become so successful. I don't hear you very well. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you repeat this? Uh, okay. Uh, both EPR uh, thought experiment and Maxwell's demand uh, has generated considerable diverse opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems to be uh, uh, the successful aspect or the, or the positive aspect of these uh, thought experiments. So unlike, uh, so the lack of consensus itself become a positive aspect for this kind of thought experiments. Contrast to uh, your view where when, when there is no consensus, uh, that's a failed thought experiment. What's your take on this? No, but even that's though, a, yeah. yeah. No, that's even though we have, uh, sorry, even though we have uh, John Norton uh, claiming uh, the Maxwell's demand is the uh, worst thought experiment in his next uh, article. Uh, for uh, similar reasons you produced. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I find it a bit difficult to solve because precisely for the same reason, uh, because we thought experiments did generate uh, considerable debate and diverse opinion. So this seems to be successful thought experiments. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for this question. And in fact, one could multiply examples, you know, also if you think as Schrodinger's cat, I think this shows how problematic it is to, to say that the goal of thought experiments is to produce new knowledge. Of course, Maxwell's demon, this is um, a way to, to highlight you know, paradoxical implications of, of thermodynamics. So many also scientific thought experiments are there to um, reveal paradoxical implications of theories. So a demon who defeats this is able to defeat the second law of thermodynamics. If something is not so, uh, and it's exactly what you say. It's not that these are not thought experiments which generate consensus. These are thought experiments which highlight problematic aspects of the theory or are meant to provoke discussion, uh, which is why I think that it is um, not very useful simply to ask the question, does the thought experiment produce new knowledge? Because we have to agree what we understand by new knowledge, not necessarily to learn something about the world um, out there, but of course, you know, to reason about our conceptualization of the world and about the uh, aptness of our conceptual apparatus uh, to describe the world. Okay, we actually have two other questions that are related to this. Uh, Gideon Manning and Ori Belkind. So Gideon, why don't you ask first and then uh, Ori? Gideon, are you there? I think we might have lost him. So oh, Ori. Well then, <laughs> then Ori, maybe maybe you can ask your question now. Well, yeah, I, I don't think it's a new question. I think it's the same one. So it just seems like a non-starter to say that 
the purpose of a good thought experiment is to produce consensus. Um, so I, I think I'm just waving my, my question because I think you answered it. Okay. Um, has, Gide is, is, has Gideon disappeared? Yes. Okay. There are now, there are two questions on Leibniz. Uh, one by Dennis Dagchi and the other from Anach Benyami. Uh, so Dennis, why don't you uh, begin? Hi. So yes. uh, I want to ask you about uh, Leibniz's um, use of an example of uh, the mill in Monad Monadology 17. So there uh, Leibniz asks us to imagine uh, a machine whose structure uh, makes it think, sense, and have perceptions. Uh, and we consider it enlarged, keeping the same proportions, but uh, Inspecting it, we are supposed to not see that there is thought or perception in it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, is this mill uh, of Leibniz is part of a thought experiment in that example, or uh, is this too briefly described to be a thought experiment? Uh, now, it's briefly described than the Lux, Custer, and Pollux, I think. Uh, but does that make it inadequately described in that way? And one more, uh, so the uh, Lux example was brought to answer questions about uh, properties uh, of the soul, whether it's always thinks uh, and always conscious and so on. Linus example concerned explanation, uh, whether uh, perception has a mechanical explanation. So the, the question about the property uh, falls somewhat to the side. Uh, at this initial state. But does that make it important to differ from the ki uh, kind of example that Locke uses? Uh, and is there a significance uh, to that? I lost you at some moment, so I hope I understood your questions correctly. Um, the question about uh, Leibniz Mill is a very interesting one because, um, you know, in all these anthologies on thought experiments, the mill is often included. There are many of these booklets which are also used for pedagogical purposes. Um, of course, you know, it's a matter we, we have to decide because it, the notion of thought experiment is a notion we have coined. So we, we can agree with one another how we want to use it. But I think it would make sense to say that uh, what one of the authors says is that uh, thought experience should not be mere illustrations of something that should, could um, uh, as well be established without them. So what I, in my perception, this new thought experience is more an illustration of Leibniz's view. So it's more, in a way, a visual way to, um, of explaining what Leibniz thinks. For the same reason, for example, I would be reluctant to consider the Fabre du Monde by Descartes, a thought experiment. So in fact, a thought experiment must be in a scenario in which you present a scenario and then you ask, what do you think would happen? There must be a question at the end, which is exactly what we have seen in the cases I discussed. Galileo, who, who has first in preach asked, what do you think would happen if the earth were removed? What do you think would happen if we detached apart from the moon? What do you think would happen if the earth was annihilated? And then, even in the field of more conceptual thought experiment, there is this question which Locke asks, do you think that Castro and Pollux would be the same person or not? In evaluative thought experiment, ethical thought experiment, what would you do in such a situation? In the case of Leibniz, there is no question involved. So in my view, this is more an illustration of um, The second question, I think I, I missed it partially and what I had missed, I forgot in the meantime. Uh, so can you please remind me of your second question? Well, in a way you've answered it, uh, because um, the question was whether it's being so briefly described makes it um, inadequately described as a thought experiment. Yeah. But if it's not considered a thought experiment, but an illustration, then the briefness yeah. does not matter in that respect. Yeah. Uh, and the third was, well, if we consider a thought experiment, whether uh, the fact that it concerns the explanation versus just uh, whether something uh, has this or that property 
uh, sep can be separable from that property or not. But the, uh, that was a relevant thing. But perhaps you've answered that too. Now, Leibniz does uh, engage in thought experiments elsewhere. In a, I think thought experiments in your sense, perhaps. Like in the brief yeah. demonstration, he proves, uh, argues against uh, Descartes' law of conservation of quantity of motion by describing the scenario it's not that well i've done this and then did that and then i found out that this is what it does it's set up as an example of uh, what uh, the what would follow from the uh, yeah. uh, premises if uh, we set up in a situation of that sort so Leibniz is i believe in that case uh, giving something closer to what you think is a total experiment uh, absolutely, he does, for, and this is why it's I, it's interesting to see how he reacts to to, to Locke's thought experiment. Because, for example, he does react to um, he does analyze the, the famous Molinaire's problem, the new essays, and notoriously he notoriously provides a different answer than than Locke. Uh, but there are there is another case, for example, in which he refuses to analyze a thought experiment, and this is the thought experiment of the man at the edge of the universe, which is this discussed by Locke, which is one of the most ancient thought experiments in the history of philosophy, which is, goes back to Archytas. And in this case, for example, Leibniz does not enter into the thought experiment. I have an hypothesis why he does so. Uh, so the fact that he refuses you know, to discuss some thought experiments is not because he doesn't consider it useful instruments, but often because he has got theoretical reasons not to do this. And there are others with, to which he reacts, and others like the one you mentioned, which he himself Proposes. Can I can I just come in here for just a moment on this? Um, I think that you know, what Dennis, mm -hmm. the thought experiment in Leibniz to refute Descartes' conservation uh, law involves constructing a situation where if Descartes' conservation law were true, you could build a perpetual motion machine, for example. Yeah. But what's really interesting, I think, is the conversation that follows from that afterwards um, between Leibniz <clears throat> and his, his opponents about whether or not even under Descartes' laws that is possible. And in particular, it involves the idea of whether you can transfer all of the motion from one body to another. Yeah. Um, which, which has in fact also to do with another elastic theme. inelastic. Yeah. Yeah. Except on another theme of um, um, the problem of what constitutes a good thought experiment or not. But Amach uh, Ben Yami also had a question about Leibniz. Thanks, Dan. Um, it's not such an important question, actually. Uh, first, first, I'll, I'll say that uh, with the Shinod and Ori, I was surprised uh, by uh, what you were. Uh, said of uh, uh, Pajnenberg and Atkinson's paper, do they really think that that's a good uh, thought experiment or just a successful thought experiment? Because certainly, as you know, mentioned, there are plenty of uh, cases in which, uh, in physics, in which we have controversial thought experiments, which have been really important to the development of science from uh, at least Newton bucket, Newton's bucket, uh, and then uh, Maxwell's demon and so on. So, so uh, if you have a quotation from them, that would be helpful. Perhaps you gave one, but I don't remember. Uh, yeah, I gave one, and then they, 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 what they say, but it's an article you can find, which was also criticized. Then the Connitz wrote a very intelligent answer to this article, which then provoked a counter argument by, by Pinenberg and Atkinson. And Connitz's point was exactly that it's, it's reductive, that it's not reproductive to think in these terms of good and bad thought experiments and that in fact one a very important function of thought experience to produce discussion of course um, so but this is the point they make and the, the debate between the Panemburg and Act and Konitz is, is an interesting uh, one and it's interesting that you mentioned Newton's bucket because in this review I wrote about this research campaign into thought experiments in which I pointed to the many, many um, disagreements there are. This bucket thought experiment is, is, is discussed in one article as a very good example of a thought experiment and other authors say, you know, it doesn't make sense to consider the thought experiment. It is simply to be an argument which, which uh, Newton uses to illustrate this point. And also there, there is no question of what would happen. Newton is simply telling 
think of describing what would happen in the case of this rotating bucket. So the, this, the answer of this question, what would happen, that the fact that we are not even given the chance to make a prediction would not make it a thought experiment according to some people. But then uh, Leibniz and later Mach and Einstein disagreed with the Newton's uh, conclusion. So uh, um, the, the other point I wanted to make, a uh, very small one about uh, Leibniz's uh, disagreement with the uh, Look about uh, the soul uh, that uh, that cannot leave the body because a soul always has somebody. But uh, the body that the soul has to have, according to Leibniz, can be really tiny, tiny part of the body. So uh, you know, uh, Pollux's soul can live with just you know a few yeah. atoms, so to say, just the atoms, and move yeah. to castles and then back. So yeah. we can uh, recover the argument uh, on uh, Leibniz's terms. Yeah. No. Yeah, but the point is that Leibniz there uses this argument in order to refuse having to give provide an answer to this thought experience. So this is what is interesting to us: the fact that he says, um, I, "I, I don't, you know," because Pinaletta says, "If you agreed with the Christians, then now I would be curious to know what you think." And Leibniz answers, "You know, I don't have to tell you what I think because to me this is an impossible fiction." And by the way, this expression "impossible fiction," I've, I've um, published an article on the, on the Leibniz Clark correspondence and the use of some thought experiments in the Leibniz Clark correspondence. And there, there is this recurrent term "impossible fiction," of which I've tried to make sense in this article. So also in this Leibniz Clark correspondence, there, there is this famous thought experiment of God. Could God remove the whole world in a straight line, which is a thought experiment of medieval origin, on which Leibniz and Clark disagree. And it's a thought experiment which also can help us understand how they conceived also the relation between imaginable uh, conceivability and possibility, which is also a very important theme which I haven't addressed today, which is a stake. So it's whatever we can imagine a physical represents a physical possibility uh, or not. So how should we conceive? Um, and what does Leibniz mean when he says, for example, about this thought expand that it is an impossible fiction, that it could not take place in any possible world? Um, which is, of course, an important point. As for the uh, Newton's bucket, bucket, of course, the fact that Mach and, um, disagrees with Newton's solution does not mean that he disagrees with the description of what happens with water in the bucket. The question, he disagrees about interpretation, of course, of this fact. So it's not, there is no question in the thought experiment which you say, what do you think would happen, which produces a lack of consensus. You know, what happens to the water when the bucket stops rotating? It's something in which they agree. The question is a question of interpretation, of course. Whether or not we need absolute space as a frame of reference with respect to which we have to, uh, as it were, locate the, the curvature of water and whether or not we should consider it an absolute motion or a relative one. Okay. Uh, oh, are you finished? Okay. Next person on my list is David Penna. Is David Penna still there? Maybe not. Uh, Mike Jacobides. I am here. Oh, you are here, good. Sorry. Um, my question is whether you have any thoughts about why thought experiments are so common in physics and in philosophy as opposed to some other disciplines, and whether there is something about those two fields that makes those of us who work in them sort of attracted to this specific kind of imaginative act. This is a good question. Uh which I've never thought in this book with Routledge Companion, there is a whole section on uh, thought experiments in, uh, in their fields, political philosophy, economics, uh, uh, ethics, okay, but this is of course biology, mathematics. Um, there are authors who claim that thought experiments are also used in other uh, disciplines. Think, uh, is that maybe there are subfields of physics in which thought experiments tend to be more 
use, for example, uh, but really something I've never thought about. But now that you ask this question, we should ask in which subfields of philosophy, for example, or, or physics thought experiments are used. So we often find them in cosmology, and these are in cases in which, of course, we cannot resource to real experiments. There is also an important question which concerns the relation between real experiments and what are called idealized experiments, what we often do in the field of physics, and this is something Galileo did to use thought experiments simply as idealized experiments. So we start with real experiment and when we think away a disturbing factors, so the friction of the air. So these are more idealization um, passages to the limit. So these are things we use when we cannot resort to real experiments. So one would claim maybe for biologists, it is more less tempting to resort to thought experiments. Although then there are people who say, for example, that Darwin did use some thought experiments uh, in support of his evolutionary theory. So I think there are some subfields of physics, uh, things in you know, cosmology or um, in which when you resource to thought experiment uh, by lack of an alternative. Um, and in the field of philosophy, I think because thought experiments are very useful to uh, delimit the boundary of, of a concept. So it is often very useful to, to use thought experiments um, I don't know, for example, if you want to explain the difference between a voluntary act and the free act, this is the voluntary prisoner against by Locke. And you can imagine a situation in which, you know, a person is free, uh, would not be free to do something, but would be willing to do something. So we create situations which enable us to discriminate among concepts which might appear contiguous, but in fact are not. Um, Sometimes in the field, for example, ethics, one uses thought experiments because sometimes it's important to imagine extreme situations in order to test the validity of our moral assumptions. This might also be simply due to historical reasons that there is a tradition because one theme I find very fascinating about philosophical thought experiments is that they tend to pop up time and again in history. So it's also a way to inscribe oneself into a tradition, to enter into a dialogue with previous philosophers this thought experiment of the man at the edge of the universe, which I mentioned, is a thought experiment which is used by Archytas, which pops up in some medieval works, which is used by Locke, by Gassendi, by Hobbes, if I'm not wrong. So sometimes it's also, you know, to, to, uh, to reuse a thought experiment as a way to um, positionate yourself, to, to take position in a debate and to, to enter into dialogue with previous philosophers. So it's also maybe a matter of tradition within a discipline. Um, I don't know. These are tentative. Don, Donna had a comment that I think is directly relevant to this discussion. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was kind of wondering whether uh, thought experiments are more abundant in fields in which they are used in teaching. And this relates, of course, with your example of philosophy. Probably mathematics and physics are on the same uh, kind, of the same kind. And if so, then there must be a connection between teaching and the development of thought experiments. And now if I think of Galileo's uh, examples in the dialogue, now about two thirds of them are related with teaching or trying at least to teach Simplicio's imagination to go beyond you know, what he knows by heart from reading Aristotle. So I wanted to hear more about what you think about this connection with yeah. and method of teaching and thought experiments. Yeah, now, there is also, I think, some literature on this. I think this is a very important point. One of the points I make, in fact, that, that um, in the literature, the uh, heuristic demonstrative function of thought experiments tends to be overemphasized and the, the pedagogical function to be there emphasized. It's enough to look at, at Einstein. If one looks at the evolution of physics or so popularizing work with uh, Einstein, info, it starts with the, the thought experiment by Galileo with, uh, uh, with which Galileo uh, proved the principle of inertia of the conservation of motion, I should say. And then um, if I'm not wrong, uh, 
Einstein uses the term imaginary experiments. And what he says is that, in fact, you know, in order to avoid using complex formula and so what helps sometimes is to use imaginary experiments. And this is also what he does in all the popularizing works in which, with which he illustrates the, uh, the theory of relativity. If you think the theory of special relativity, there, there is a famous thought experiment of the train. The general relativity, there is the elevator. So it is clear that in Einstein's work, these thought experiments have more of a pedagogical, didactical function than they have a heuristic function. So there is certainly a tradition, and my point is, in fact, that Galileo uses it precisely to explain to his readers what is at stake there. And in fact, I know that thought experiments tend to be used also in the teaching of physics to make you know, um, problems more accessible. So that's certainly an extremely important function of, of thought experiments. There is a polemical function, as I've seen, you know, how Galileo uses it to have, you know, this, the characters discuss the polemical function of Locke's thought experiments, their anti-Cartesian goal, and indeed this didactical, pedagogical function. Okay, there's a lot of activity on the chat room. Um, but the next person on my list is Mike Jacobides. Hi, thanks. I liked your talk. Um, what do you think uh, your do you think your examples and analyses of them uh, confirm or disconfirm uh, Norton's thesis that um, thought experiments can be paraphrased away, or Kuhn's thesis that they're really important in showing the differences between paradigms? I guess I thought that maybe it could go both ways, given that you had these big general premises that you could spell out. Uh, but but also that it can't go both ways because they're sort of incompatible approaches. I, I have an unstable, yeah, I opened the door because it says that my internet connection is unstable, so I, I missed the first part of your question. Okay, so do you, what do you think, do you think these, your account, your examples, your analysis of them confirm or disconfirm Norton's claims about thought experiments or and Kuhn's claims about thought experiments? Um, no, I'm, I don't think they disconfirm. I think the, the, the fact is that both Kuhn and uh, Norton are selective in their choice of thought experiments, which is, of course, perfectly legitimate. So I'm not denying that there are thought experiments which do play the role which Kuhn's, uh, Kuhn Oops. I think we may have lost Carla Rita. And I want to know the answer to that question. <laughs> Let's wait for a few moments until she returns. There you are. Carla Rita, can you hear us? Can you speak? Maybe until, uh, until Carla Rita comes back, let's have a look at the chat line. Um, there are a number of suggestions of clarifying this and that. So, Can you so hear me? Rana has something to say. Yes, Carla. Are you back? Welcome back. Because I could, I could hear you and I could see myself, but I couldn't. Uh, so I don't know how, how much you missed. So what I'm claiming is that, well, what I was saying is that both Kuhn and Norton are, are a bit selective in their choices of thought experience, which is perfectly legitimate. But what I claim is that precisely due to their views, they tend to neglect thought experiments, which do not have the scope of producing knowledge. So what I'm doing in my, so I'm not denying that there is the thought experiment in Galileo, the one of the two balls, uh, the, the two bodies which are linked with a, with a thread, which is used to, to make a positive claim and to demonstrate something. I'm not claiming that Galileo does not think that thought experiments in some cases can have demonstrative function. But what I'm saying is that given that he's also imagining and devising other kinds of thought experiments, that they also have a different 
uh, function. So I think that the, the examples Kuhn chooses tend to confirm his theory, but there are many examples he neglects, which are interesting for, for other reasons. Thought experience, which play a different role, but it's still an important role. And the very fact that Galileo uses so many of these thought experiments must make us wonder why, ask ourselves why he does this and what he wants to achieve. Carla Rita, I think it may be better if you turn off your camera. Turn it off my camera. Or what I can do is link to use hotspot and uh, try to see whether I've got a better internet connection with the uh, hotspot. Okay, because on my screen it says your network bandwidth is, is low. My connection is low. Let me try with this. Now, is it better now? I've now got a different internet connection with hotspot. Well, let's try this for a while, yes. Let's try this for a while, okay. Let's that's see better. That's better. Uh, yeah. The next on my list is Omar, Omar Del Nono. Is Thank Omar you. still here? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Because I have some problem with the camera. I, I can okay. hear you. Okay, thank you. So I have two questions. The first one is, um, you, to, you told us um, that there is an article or a work uh, of Guru and Geoffrey about uh, thought experiments and they um, uh, offer three criteria, counterfactual mm -hmm. statements, real scenario, and they missed the third one. Can you repeat it? Uh, so, yeah, the third uh, one is that they, have a, they claim the cognitive intention. So okay. that thought experiments are meant to provide an answer to a theoretical question. I think, by the way, that these criteria are partially um, borrowed from Tamar Gendler. Ah, okay. Yeah. And the second question is related with these criteria. For example, I'm in. Uh, I had some trouble. I'm working on Spinoza, and I have some trouble to recognize sometimes if um, some fictions or. Uh, argument uh, could be considered tooth experiments or not uh, because sometimes the counterfactual structure is not um, it's not there or it's not clear a clear counterfactual uh, structure and I wanted to ask to you if um, in early mother periods it's so important that um, the first criteria is there or uh, for example um, uh, sometimes analogy or uh, um, uh, the use of hypotheses and then the refutation of hypotheses could be seen as a, a part of the thought experiment. Also, if we can consider it as a, as a kind of thought experiment for that time or not, because uh, for example, in my case, uh, the epistemological uh, structure, the theory of knowledge is a little bit particular. And if you use the criteria that the logical criteria, sometimes it doesn't fit. Um, I don't know if my question is clear, but yeah, I'm I referring didn't... to the letter 32, 32 of Spinoza, for example. I don't know if you read it. The, I, I the don't know. The blocks. Maybe read, but I don't know where I know it's letter 32. But yeah. the point is, I think it's a matter of, of um, uh, again, of, of uh, agreement. So I, I do not uh, think that we must have an essentialistic definition. We have to agree with one another. So if one deals with the thought experiment, one should start by defining what one means by this and then try to be consistent. So I'm not claiming that, that one could not extend the theory to include. What I find, for example, about this book of Fresher is that in introduction, he provides some criteria, uh, which I now could not quote by heart, to define thought experiments. And then he provides some example in this appendix of text, which in my view disagree with his own criteria. So he's not consistent in the definition. The other question is, you know, in some cases, I think one simply uses an analogy. What does one gain if one want to rebaptize an argument as a thought experiment? So if you think, you know, the counterfactual element is not there, maybe we should not want to, we do not need to call this a thought experiment, but maybe more of an analogy. As far as counterfactuality is concerned, um, 
I'm not sure whether I understood your question, but the, another in question which is addressed is how counterfactual must thought experiments be in the sense that there are, there are of course degrees of counterfactuality. There are thought experiments which are strongly counterfactual in the sense that they describe scenarios which are impossible. There are thought experiments which are uh, have a lower degree of counterfactuality. This means thought experiments which maybe could be performed, but it would be too expensive to perform them. And thought experiments of which um, Sorensen says, if I'm not wrong, that they could easily be performed, but they're not performed due to lack of a, um, evidential gain. So that you know, we know it is so clear what would happen that we simply do not need to perform that. Um, another important question is why, for example, Galileo describes as thought experiments experiments of which we know that he performed them, like the one of the of the ball dropped from the mast of a moving ship, and he claimed that he did not perform it, whereas we know that he did. So thought experiments to be counterfactual simply means that they are not performed. And in some cases, they're not performed because they cannot be performed. In some cases, they are not performed for other reasons, because it's not considered useful or possible or affordable to perform them. But I'm not sure whether this is an answer to your question. No, no, it's, it's exactly the answer, because I, I added what, what I meant with counterfactual is uh, the problem, the logical structure, for example, that the prothesis is wrong, and then also the hypothesis is wrong, these logical structures that I'm not always fine. But your answer is really clear, and I would say, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. OK, we have two questions uh, relating to Galileo, one from Daria Drozdova and the other from Philip Buzin. So Daria? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlarita. Finally, I can meet you maybe yeah. online, I suppose, next time in, in name again. Uh, well, uh, uh, it's very nice talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. And well, my question is related to this very famous thought experiment of Galileo. And maybe this thought experiment should be considered to be uh, a separate kind of experiment. Uh, because I, I have three questions to you. I try to make them very short. First of all, uh, why, what do you think about why this experiment was so successful? Why it was possible to Galileo to make this argument before any experiencing? Mm -hmm. uh, the second part of this question, uh, do you know any other thought experiment of this kind, which uh, permit to scientists to make a claim about reality before doing any actual experiment, like a priori. Okay. And, and maybe the third part I will ask. Maybe. No, can, you can ask it now so that I can- oh, It's about Parelli because it was my question I wrote there. I tried to, 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 to study this connection like line between Benedetti Galileo and then uh, Al uh, Giovanni Alfonso Barelli, uh, who later in 17th century, he wrote uh, this tractat on uh, moving uh, the, 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 the motion of body under gravity. And he, he made this as a like geometrical demonstration using the same scheme of dividing body in parts and making this as a list of propositions like uh, proposition uh, unequal weights do not produce unequal velocities, but one and the same velocity and demonstration. Then for example, two unequal geometric homogeneous bodies are equally rapid in their nature and then demonstration. So my question was uh, when the, the thought experiment became just a demonstration, is there any line between them? No, these are a difficult question. Let's start uh, by saying it's good that you mentioned Benedetti because in fact, um, the first article I wrote on Galileo's thought experiment was an article in which I, I showed that many of Galileo's thought experiment, in fact, have um, uh, are in a way remake of thought experiments which were proposed in the past. Uh, so there I react to McAllister's claim according to which Galileo invented new kind of uh, arguments. And what I claim in, 
this first article is that, in fact, um, what Galileo often does was to reuse medieval thought experiment. And this thought experiment has also a medieval antecedent, uh, which only concerns bodies of the same material. But it, it has an, I'm not sure it was Alexander of Aphrodisias. I should know this, but I can, I can look it up. So, but it has medieval antecedents. And what, what happens is what, what I claim that Galileo does uh, that uh, there are two kinds of medieval thought experiments. The first kind, the first group are thought experiments which refer to our world. And in this case, Galileo often uh, reuses, and this thought experiment were used, for example, by the partisans of the impetus theory to criticize some tenets of Aristotle theory. And Galileo borrows this medieval thought experiments. And he, the only thing is that he's more radical in his criticism of the Aristotelian theory than his medieval predecessors. So what he says is you have seen a problem there in Aristotle theory, and but you haven't drawn the, the conclusions for your argument. And then there are these thought experiments, which um, medieval natural philosophers used, which were thought experiments, the potentia absoluta, which concerned alternative world. And what Galileo does, but this is a point which Funkenstein made, was to claim that things which other philosophers, for example, Rehm, thought could be the case in an alternative world was in fact the case in our world. A typical example is the void. So all these natural philosophers after the condemnation of 12, 1277 had to claim that the void was possible. According to Aristotle, a void was impossible. According to Aristotle, it was impossible for God to create two equal worlds. According to this medieval natural philosophy, it was possible the potentia absoluta. What Galileo does is to transfer these possibilities from the theoretical realm of alternative words to our world. And this is something he also does with this one thought experiment in which this void is, of course, an hypothetical something, but it becomes something then real in, in Galileo. Why is this thought experiment so successful? So also in this case, I think it's important to see that there is a prehistory to this thought experiment that Galileo borrows it. I think the reason why it was so successful is also due to the way in which Galileo formulates it. And what Brown says it, to him, it is an example of a platonic thought experiment because it's um, it's, it is uh, destructive and constructive at the same time. So it's a thought experiment which Galileo uses to refute an Aristotelian assumption, namely that the speed of fall is proportional to weight, and at the same time to make a new point, a positive claim that in the void, all bodies would fall at the same speed. Whether or not it is such a good thought, there is an article whether or not Galileo invented the best thought experiment ever. Um, there are also people who claim that the thought experiment is not as clever as it is. Um, it's not a thought experiment to which I devoted much attention because to me, this is the clear case. You know, This is a thought experiment with a heuristic function. And I was more interested in analyzing all the other thought experiments which have been neglected. But I think so this thing, it's not exactly new. What is new is the way in which Galileo uses it. And I think what, what makes this thought experiment so interesting is the way in which Galileo connects in his work real experiments and, uh, and imaginary experiments. So how the, the two, and this is also something which Einstein liked so much about Galileo in this preface to the translation by Drake to the dialogue. Einstein says, you know, that it was not correct to see or to speak in terms of this opposition between the experimental Galileo and Galileo the theoretical. Scientist, as you know, there has been this debate in the literature. You know, is Galileo the father of experimental science, or is he, as Coiré thought, someone who used thought experiments? And Einstein said, you know, he was both, which is also what Einstein himself did. So I think what is fascinating is the way in which Galileo has this part of deduction of the law of free fall, the experiment of the inclined plane to confirm the law, and then this thought experiment he uses to try to guess what would happen in a void, which Galileo considers real, contrary to his Aristotelian opponents, but he did not have the instruments to, you know, he did not have vacuum pump at his disposal to form a real void, and hence he uses this uh, thought experiment. Okay. Um, sure um, whether this is an it, answer. Okay, very good. Um, uh, Philip Pisa also on Galileo. Hello, good evening, uh, Carla Hello. Rita. Thank you for your talk. In the meantime, uh, you have already answered uh, my question partially, but uh, I uh, wanted to come back also to the law of falling bodies. So uh, as you have just indicated, um, he found the law based on assumption uh, that there is a vacuum effect, 
but I thought he was rather an adept of the horror vacuum theory, so he did uh, not really believe that a void existed. Uh, ne neither did his opponents, as you have just mentioned. However, via his thought experiment, he found a conclusion which was centuries later conferred by physical experiment on the moon. So uh, do, do you have any thoughts on the fact that sometimes you have a relation between um, um, uh, thought experiment and uh, a physical uh, experiment uh, that in fact confirms often uh, thought experiments which uh, seem to be uh, firstly uh, uh, not really valid. Uh, yeah. And you have got two questions. The first one, I'm not sure I agree with you because that, that's true. It is true that Galileo used this notion of horror vacui. So there were, for example, already Bateman and Baliani had intuited that there was such a thing as atmospheric pressure. Galileo speaks of um, this resistance to the void. But the difference between Galileo and the Aristotelians is that according to the Aristotelians, the void was really impossible. Whereas according to Galileo, nature does its best to prevent the formation of a void, but at a certain point, nature has to surrender and the void is being formed. So in this example, this, there is this real experiment which Galileo describes in the first day of the discourse with a piston, with a weight. Yeah. And there is a moment in which the yeah. nature, as it were, overcomes this horror vacuum. So it's not, it's something which with nature tends to, to avoid, but it is a theoretical possibility. And if you think of the atomism of, of Galileo, of course, in the, in the discourse, he claims that solid bodies are kept together by the fact that there are an infinite number of non-extended voids which take together the parts of the atoms. And if these voids were added up to one another, one would have a microscopic void. So according to Galileo, a void is not easily formed in nature, but it does not represent a physical impossibility. And nature surrenders. So it is said that the, according to Galileo, horror back is a positive force which he can quantify and measure, and the void is, of course, uh, possible. As for the second point, there are many examples of thought experiments which at a certain point become real experiments. Before, even before you know the moon landing, once there was this uh, the, the vacuum pump was invented, there was one of the first things which were done was to test Galileo's claim that a coin and a feather would fall with the same speed. There is this note by Heichens who say, says, writes to his, a letter to his brother in which he says, you know, there is here the vacuum pump, which can be used to make many fascinating experiments and to test the laws of physics. And he was exactly thinking of this uh, Galileo's assumption. So the, his claim that, that bodies of different weight would fall at the same speed was verified with a vacuum pump. And there are, in fact, the thought experiments which become real experiments in the evolution of physics. There is, in one of the, append the, the, the notes to the uh, one of later editions, Einstein, but I cannot, I don't remember which one it was, writes, uh, when, I, when, when I wrote the first edition of this work, we referred to this thought experiment. He doesn't call it thought experiment, the idealized experiment. In the meantime, the, this experiment has been performed in Russia, and this is the, the result. This, I referred briefly to this Molyneux question, this Molyneux mm -hmm. thought experiment, which is discussed by Locke and Leibniz, was in fact performed in the 18th century. So there are thought experiments, experiments which were born as real exper as thought experiments, and which become thought experiments. Okay. There are many examples. Thank you. Thank you. We have three more questions and about 10 more minutes, so I think we're going to be able to make it. The next question is um, Ori Bilkind. Is Ori still here? Yeah, I'm here. Good. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm crouched on the couch here. So, um, so maybe something is, is misleading about the notion of a thought experiment, because when we say that we use an experiment, we usually try to confirm or sort of verify a certain hypothesis, hypothesis or, or a theory. Um, and so there's a certain kind of relationship between what's going on in the experiment and what we expect the hypothesis to receive as a result of carrying out the experiment. 
And maybe that's a kind of a misleading picture as to what's going on with a thought experiment because uh, it's as if we are um, carrying out some counterfactual, counterfactual scenario and then we use that counterfactual scenario to get some confirmation for a hypothesis or a theory. And it might be that this is just misleading us into uh, various ways of trying to think about it because uh, one can think of these various counterfactual scenarios as doing something different than confirmation or verification. So one, one thing that I, you can think about is perhaps uh, say with the Galileo uh, thought experiment that you mentioned, um, the, there's a certain sense in, in which the thought experiment is trying to flesh out a certain ambiguity that, that has to do with the way that the laws of nature are, are articulated in Aristotle's physics. So if we say that natural motion is towards the center of the earth, and at the same time, we say that natural motion is towards the center of the universe, and we sort of associate the center of the earth and with the center of the universe, then what the thought experiment, experiment is trying to do is it's trying to articulate or flesh out a certain ambiguity in how the laws of nature in Aristotle are articulated. And so it's a different relationship between what the counterfactual scenario is doing and what it, the relationship is supposed to do, it's supposed to have with the theory or with the hypothesis. It's not necessarily confirmation or verification, it may be something entirely different. I perfectly agree. That's a very interesting point. I think that there are um, uh, also, for example, I, I refer to the fact that James McAllister thinks that thought experiments were born during the scientific revolution. And in his view, this also means that thought experiments uh, were, in fact, um, in a way, derived from real experiment, that one needed the notion of experiment in order to be able to perform a thought experiment. But this is a historical claim, which I think with which I disagree because I think the thought experiments are omnipresent in the history of philosophy. And my intuition is the same as yours, that sometimes they, they are meant more to maybe to test the consistency of our conceptual apparatus. One thing which makes them resemble real experiments in some cases is the fact that we can do with thought experiments what we can do with real experiments, namely vary the conditions one at a time. So one starts with an imaginary scenario and then you modify the condition then see you see whether, for example, your intuition about what would happen would change. You know, so the way in which we manipulate the variables might in some cases be similar, but I agree with you that I think that this is also what misleads people in over and think that, that what thought experiments are meant to do is to produce real knowledge and so to produce consensus and to persuade and when they do not manage, then we consider them bad thought experiments, whereas if we agree with one another, this is not their function, then of course, we also have different criteria in deciding whether they are successful. But I've got, you formulated much better than I could have done. I think I have the same intuition that it, it is misleading. And this is again, a theme which I found in this book in which some people claim that one has to take the experimental part of thought experiment very seriously, and that they are in fact surrogates for real experiments and people who contributors who seem to suggest that something different is going on. Thought experience and real experience. Okay, um, David Miller and then Pauline Pemister. David, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Um, I think actually my question is, uh, is just a reformulation and follow up of the last couple of uh, questions. Um, and I was just asked, and, and so maybe just what I'd like to ask is, is I'm not sure that Carla Rita that you came down on whether you think that thought experiments actually do generate knowledge. Um, and, and my question then was, well, if they do, if, if we can, if at least some of them do, uh, presumably they have to fit into some sort of scientific method, right? Um, that generates knowledge. And so the question is what, how, what role do they play? Um, on your view, are they are they evidence collection? Are they you know disconfirmations? I mean, when if there is a particular thought experiment that does generate knowledge, how does it do so? Um, and and so picking up on Ori's point that you know maybe not all thought experiments have that function, but supposing that one does, what how does it do it? Right? Yeah. What, what what method does it follow? 
So my answer is to begin with that I thought that I think that in most cases this is not uh, the goal of thought experiment. So that what in most cases what they aim to achieve that the authors who use thought experiments is either to indeed uh, to emphasize, for example, paradoxical aspects of a theory, to generate discussion, to challenge uh, an assumption, or to test the consistency of a theory. In some cases, they seem to generate knowledge, and this is the example about which Daria also asked the question, uh, a thought experiment which seems to prove something. And in this case, I think that we might agree with Norton that thought experiments which do generate new knowledge are nothing else than arguments in this guy. So the thought experiments by Galileo, in fact, he formulated as, you know, let's imagine we have got two balls, one of one kilo, one of 10, let's imagine that one connects them. The contemplation of the scenario doesn't add much. So he could have formulated the very same thing by saying, let's suppose that, you know, there are these two bodies according to you, this is what would follow. So it's not by chance that Norton chooses this one example to show how thought experiments can to can be translated into arguments. So my point would be when they generate new knowledge, they do so because they function actually as arguments in disguise. So in that, in that sense, Norton is right. When they cannot be translated into arguments is because what they're doing is they're thought provoking. And in some cases, they're meant precisely to, to generate lack of consensus and they force of scientists to spell out their assumptions. So this one example of Mary, the color scientist, on which uh, you know there is no agreement whether or not she acquires new knowledge. One important function of the thought experience was that you know one had to spell out what do, do we mean by knowledge. Of course, is knowledge only propositional knowledge? Is it something else? So if you deny that that Mary is learning something new when she sees colors for the first time, while we all have the intuition that something new is happening, then if you deny that this is new knowledge, you must spell out what you mean by knowledge. So it's a way, you know, to generate discussion and to force us to make our assumptions, our definitions more explicit. So this is my, so I'm not, my point is not that there aren't thought experiments which do function as demonstrative tools, but that many thought experiments do not function as demonstrative tools, and this doesn't make them less interesting and try to understand what function they, they have. Okay, one last question. Um, Pauline Pemister. Pauline, are you still there? Great. I am just briefly still here, um, but I'm going to have to go. So perhaps this um, question should maybe just be a, a remark or a, a, um, a kind of direction for some future discussion. Um, I, I'm always quite impressed by Locke's uh, e examples and the, the examples that he chooses to use when he's writing. And the Castor and Pollux one is um, significant. And I just wondered if um, Carla had any thoughts about um, the fact that Ca Castor and Pollux were twins. And of course, Castor was killed and then Pollux was allowed to swap D's with them in um, in Hades, but um, the fact that there are twins makes them ve so very close that they almost become indistinguishable. And I just wondered if Carla had any thoughts about that. Yeah, yeah. my thought was because if you look at the, at the um, conclusion of the argument, Locke says, "Why should we think that they are less?" not two persons just like, what is what does he say, Socrates and Plato are, and so So in fact, what he says is that the fact that they are um, twins, uh, what I think would be, um, I think it's an interesting, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question. What I think is that the fact they are twins would make us more prone to say that they are the same person. So he wants to create, so, you know, so because they, they share the soul, and their bodies are numerically different, but they are identical. And still, he says to the reader, the intuition, given that you know the soul does not know what was happening in the soul of Castro and not in the soul of Pollux, the intuition of the reader, even though there is one soul and two identical bodies, the reader would agree with Locke that they are not the same person. So he chooses an example which would be more tempting for us to conclude that they are the same person because they share one soul and they have got two identical bodies. And yet he says to the reader, I guess you will agree with me that yet they're not the same person. Why? 
because in spite of the fact that they are indistinguishable, so for, for us, if we see them, we might not tell them apart, but there is no psychological continuity. So I think it is something, it's a rhetorical trick which makes his argument even stronger, because if they were, they had different bodies, the reader might be tempted to say that they're not the same person due to the difference in appearance, but the appearance is the same, and yet the reader will agree with Locke that they're not the same person. Okay. okay. So, I think we should finish here. Thank you very, very much. I'd like you all to open your microphones and thank you, Carla, <laughs> and, and thank Carla for for a wonderful, wonderful. Thank, to thank you, you for your thank attention. You thank you again for inviting me. Our pleasure. Thank you for coming.